have happened in situations where but they did in, in local communities um, you know, did not handle the case properly will not forever foreclose that avenue uh, of, of, uh, of addressing these claims. Uh, and I would hope that we could move forward in a way in which the rabbinic community could play an extremely important role uh, in dealing with this. And I would suggest so, that many in this room would be open to having any conversations that are necessary to uh, allow that to happen. We have the order of the questions that I have is the speak lock or rabbi speak lock. Just quick ones because of time. Remember, as we realize to go, so maybe it's just some very quick questions. Deborah has come calling. Rachel Bayer, and then we'll see when if Manny is going to be. <coughs> By the way, Manny, you're from Yemen. One phone call, and you're gone. <laughs> <laughs> At least for a week. Okay. So I'm going to really address. Just I'll make it as quick as I can because I really know how to speak short. But I'm going to address what Rabbi, Rabbi Blau said really, and just add to that is, um, I think he knows this, and I'll say this proudly. He was someone that I work with very closely, who works with Safe Horizon deals with a lot of the victims that we deal with. We are noticing a much bigger trend in rabbis actually backing the victims and supporting them while they're going through the process. Um, I will s state this now publicly. Um, I'm going to say this on my end. And it's an important thing to note. We in this room that deal with victims are always dealing with, and part of my expression, with the crap of the crap. We're always dealing with stuff that makes us depressed, gets us angry. We forget that at the end of the day, we're part of Claudia Israel. There are so many good parts to it. And we're stuck dealing with a dark, dark, dark area. We need to remember that. I will say that in the last 19 years from the first time I did something, a lot has changed. And I'm going to say this publicly, a big thank you. My first ever public forum to speak about sexual abuse in the Haredi world um, was hosted by Torah Bissaro. My second one was at the Agudah Convention. And from those two events, I will tell you countless cases and rabbis have changed their opinions so much so that this past month of Shabbos, I trained 45 rabbis in Flatbush with strangles, backishes, and hats who were shocked by what was coming on. So there's definitely a change. But to add to that, and what Tamara said, and this is something that's very important, we do need to do a lot more work, but we also need to recognize many times we're focusing on the sins of what have happened. Nobody here is going to try to sugarcoat, whether it's organizations or rabbis or leaders that made mistakes in the past. We have to try to focus more on going forward, going future, and making sure that those mistakes don't get made again. You know, I'm not defending anyone that made a mistake. I'm going to say that very publicly. But if somebody in the year 2016 makes that mistake, there's zero excuse because there is awareness, there is trainings, there are things available as opposed to things from 30 years ago. And I'm not minimizing at all what happened in 1979. That's not why I'm in this field. But there's certainly an understanding that in 1979, the community was not as aware about these issues. And today they are. And I think the goal of why we're all here tonight is to take that message and push it forward so we can keep doing this and help the victims that can't speak for themselves. Now, I, uh, let me just respond. I completely agree with you that the awareness that exists today wasn't there then. That's why some of us have become activists in our full time or in our spare time. You know, having said that, I mean, these are real issues. People of all ages, when I came out publicly, people came to me, people who I never met, people I've known for 30 years and told me their story, okay? People suffer lifelong effects. The, we can't forget that, right? And so even forgetting, of, even and, and predators, particularly male predators, you're sitting next to Dr. Michael Salomon, he can cite you the statistics. You know, the, 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 group, that, the, the group of people that are most likely to recidivism, I don't know what the right verb is here, to repeat offend are male abusers of young boys, okay? And they do it their whole life or until their sex drive goes away. So we can't forget that. Of course not. Uh, Deborah Nisbaum, come on. It really builds on what the last couple of people have said, and it's specifically for Rabbi Zubel, um because the Aguda has a role in the community that is more comprehensive than that of the RCA and the modern Orthodox community. I understand now the Aguda to be not only dealing with legislative and policy matters, but also making efforts to influence the values and mores and behaviors in the community at large through articles in the Jewish Observer, for example. Um, not anymore, is it no longer being published? Oh, no. <laughs> I, I know I hadn't been getting it for a while. <laughs> I got kicked off the list. They have Mishpacha magazine. There are other publications. Okay, so but, but my question, it's an actual question. Um, <laughs> My question is this, 
uh, for Rabbi Zubel. What is the Aguda doing to push forward this agenda of supporting victims when we know, especially in the Haredi community, community approbation, people pay such a heavy price for stepping over any line. People's children are asked to leave schools, people are, you know, we're all familiar with the um, kind of self, uh, the, the implied pressure that prevents people from even beginning to think about moving forward, the assumed consequences, because everybody has seen it play out negatively. If a, a child is gay, openly gay, the other sibling, you know, they have trouble making shit up for other children, uh, et cetera, et cetera. Somebody's divorced or whatever, or there's mental illness, you know, God forbid. Um, so with something like this, what is the Aguda doing to shift the culture at the grassroots level? Because you do have influence there. The mechanism through which we try to do that from time to time, and as we alluded to earlier, is the Aguda Convention more than anything else, which is an annual event, and we have actually now one in the Midwest as well. We just concluded one of there. And over the last number of years, this and other similar kinds of issues have been put front and center on the agenda of these conventions. You know, he mentioned that he spoke this year at the Aguda Convention. Spoke twice, actually. Spoke to a room full of, of rabbis, of about 50 rabbis or so, 60 rabbis who were in the room at the time that he spoke from around the country, and he spoke to a, you know, the, the, our, our delegates more generally. Uh, and, and this is the kind of, you know, we've had some uh, the similar sessions at, 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 uh, at conventions of wherever, and you know, it is a message that, that uh, the very top leadership of the organization has uh, delivered. I know Rabbi Noya was hosted a, uh, I don't know if it was a convention or something similar in Fertor Masora, where uh, Rabbi Yaakov Perlov of Minsker Rebbe, who is the, uh, the Rosh Agudas Yisrael, he's the lead figure, the rabbinic figure in Agudas in Israel, and, and, uh, and he spoke uh, very prominently about this subject. Was it, was it, was it the convention Rabbi Noya? Most recent convention. So, in the last 10 years, seven out of the last 10 conventions have 1,500 teachers and principals has one session devoted to this issue. Right. So convention is one. So it's 100,000 people online. And what? Online, aside from 1,500 people there, there's another 20,000 people we live stream now, so you have people all over the world listening in. What do you mean, we're online? Yeah. <laughs> oh, we, we forgot to tell you. <laughs> That's the next conference. <laughs> um, our, Rachel? Sure. Um, just to, to gonna give a comment, but also have a question really for both of you. You know, what I'm hearing is that there is a lot of movement and for that, I thank you very much, both as a former sex crimes prosecutor as well as somebody who lives in the Orthodox community, and I think that that's very important. But my question for you is really about um, whether there has been a move, when you talk about rabbis that have had these trainings, really for both of you, and specifically when you talk about Batizim, that might be dealing with these issues, the gray area issues, right? The boundary issues that may not amount to something that's legal, or when there are victims who don't want to come forward and don't want to share their story, and you know that there's a problem within the community. What move has there been to mandate that anybody who sits on the Beit Din, or any rabbi that's dealing with these questions, which to be quite honest, is everyone, right? Is every rabbi, because they do hold a powerful place in our community, and they hold a powerful place in our community whether you, you straddle the OU slash RCA side or whether you straddle the Aguda side. So how, how about the move to make the type of forensic interview training or conversations with prosecutors and with law enforcement a mandatory part of either smicha or of requiring that in order to sit on a big team. Because how can you sit and understand the complexities of these issues, right? I mean, I'm somebody that has prosecuted thousands of cases and I learned every single day of every single year that I was a prosecutor because you can always learn something. So how is it possible that you could have people that may not have that type of either mandated, real required training to understand these issues? And the second part of my comment slash question is, 
Um, is there a move to make this really a part of requiring this type of training in order to have smicha, to go out and be that force that is someone that's going to affect people that should not be frozen out? So if you're speaking about rabbinic training, and I think that's really where you're going to make the change ultimately as things progress down the line. So Yeshiva University in the past number of years uh, has revisited its smicha program. Um, so the, the traditional class of learning is remaining the same. But the supplementary courses have, have evolved tremendously. And you have um, focus on these types of things. I just spoke, actually, to the second year of Smicha class on Friday um, about the issue of scandals in the rabbinate. So it was an hour and a half of what the issues are, what the consequences of those issues are, um, prevention of those types of things, a whole host, a whole host of things. Um, there was recently in, uh, a program that was endowed uh, by a family to deal with mental health issues and to help train rabbis in mental health issues. So there's a lot of um, attention that's being paid there to do that. In terms of mandating rabbis, I wish I could mandate a lot of things for my rabbis. I don't have, I don't have that authority. Um, to, 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 our structure is not such, but we offer many, many opportunities for rabbis to learn things. And you know, I, our rabbis are decent, um, responsible individuals. No, and no, and not, no, no, I'm saying, and because of that, doesn't mean training. No, and because of that, when they encounter something in which they feel lack, uh, insufficiently competent, they will turn for help. They will turn for types of, those types of trainings, and we continue to offer, and we continue to offer and push them to to, to consult with, with others. Uh, enforcing that, mandating it is, 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 has been a challenge for us. I just want to say what a terrific question that was too, and and. Um, I, I've spoken to many Rabbanim uh, over the years who tell, who say that uh, they feel that um, you know that, that they may not have the title, but in fact they are social workers and psychologists and, and, and are dealing with all kinds of issues. You're right, every single rabbi does. A, a rabbi in any congregation, in any community, is dealing with all kinds of a whole array of social challenges and ills in a very complicated world. Uh, that are not necessarily part of the core curriculum of, of the smicha programs in any of our yeshivos, uh, and and the reality is that today you've got to you've got to become literate and conversant and knowledgeable and or at least know where there are resources out there that can help when you deal with individual cases. But I, I think your your idea is a very intriguing one. Um, something Let's that, talk. You know, something, Let's something, talk. something that we can perhaps uh, bring to. We recognize that the that uh, neither the RCA nor the Aguda are are smicha conferring uh, uh, agencies. Uh, those typically are done through the schools, through the yeshivot. So that's that's probably where this conversation uh, might be most fruitful. I just want to add quickly that in Israel, there were no that does have that kind of power, and they did implement it through, through uh, this organization by Atom that the revenue does have, do, do have, they are mandated reporting, they have to report to. But it's a different entity, and here, you know, it's different, but they don't have the power on the rabbinim. They go to Yeshiva, and they come out, and they open their own congregation by themselves, and, you know, it's no one on top of them. Thank you. Uh, Barry? Um, my name is Barry Singer, and uh, I led a uh, lawsuit against Yeshiva University High School, against Yeshiva University, at the main section of the in Yeshiva University High School. Um, I want to thank you all for being here because I really respect what you're trying to do. But I'm kind of amazed that one thing that the two of you seem to be able to agree on unanimously is that the past uh, injustices are counterbalanced by two words that I didn't even think belonged in this room, finances and budget. Um, and I, I will propose to you this question. Do you really think that you can move forward with all of this excellent plans, these excellent plans, and these actual excellent programs, without finding some way to address the past and find justice for all of those who are still here living the nightmare that began in high school? And can I, that, that was a beautiful question, and can I even add to that as well from a, I know it's, I won't say it's only a halachic perspective, but from a religious perspective, when we're talking about the concept of teshuva, repentance, uh, and also justice, 
you know, part of that process as well, I mean, I, I don't have to teach the learned rabbis in the rooms, but I've spoken to some rabbis and they've made it very clear that anyone who has uh, requires to give an apology to a victim or whatever the circumstance, it's not good enough to simply say, we apologize for hurting you. You need to actually specify what is for. You need to offer compensation to do that. So there's the difference between what perhaps may be civil law versus halakha, which we say, you know, that is a part of it, is our understanding. And minimal compensation would be to eliminate the statute of limitations. Our lawsuit, every charge in it, was acknowledged by Yeshiva University as being true. And that, that it did happen. And more that we weren't even privy to because of the cover-up. They also acknowledged But they stomped us, Yeshiva in the courtroom and left us out to dry in the street. So, uh, can I just, to Manny's point and adding on to this, I think it was in fifth grade when we were learning the Zeke and we learned, as it's our week, we shed the spotious. How come that doesn't count here? So, Rabbi Dratch mentioned earlier that from a halakhic perspective, there is no such thing as a statute of limitations, and that's my knowledge that's accurate. But that's an excellent point. That's right. And, and, and from a halachic perspective, if a Jew has a claim against another Jew, he ought to bring it to a Besan. Um, and I'm wondering whether that's happening. And I'm just, I'm, I'm, I'm not quite responding to your question, so whatever I respond I've said already in terms of concern Are about... Are you suggesting that we would have recourse to a Besan today? I don't know, but they certainly wouldn't be able to invoke a statute of limitations if there's no halachic principles. Yeah. And, if, 